You know, when you live the part-time RV lifestyle, travel happens on vacations, weekends, and school holidays. But the reality is you can travel farther, cover more miles, and make more memories on your vacations from work. Welcome to episode eight of the RV Connects podcast. I'm Melina, and I am joined by my much better half, Dan. Hello. And we are a family of four with a teen and a tween. And we think this episode is a pretty important one for those who have a long RV bucket list, but short vacations every year. So in this episode, we're going to talk about how to optimize your departure to cover the most ground, tips on how to manage the in-cab experience to travel farther and keep the kids entertained, time-saving tips when you need to overnight. And we'll also give a couple of examples of just how far you can go on a one or two week vacation. But before we get into it. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that wherever you listen to podcasts so you'll be first to know about new episodes when they drop. We've got some exciting road trip stories coming up that you won't want to miss. You know, one of the sole reasons we started this podcast, besides teaching people the right way to manage their black water system, was because I would get comments all the time from friends who would see these Insta pretty accounts of people who have dared to sell it all and live the full time RV dream where they can spend time in all these far flung places and say, if only and one day I'd love to travel that far. And they'd take a big sigh and go back to the office and think about their next camping trip booked, you know, somewhere an hour away from home. And I had a bit of a light bulb moment when I was talking about this and realizing like, bam, we already do this as weekend warriors. Over the last five years, we've towed over 20,000 kilometers. We've gone coast to coast. We've gone north to south. We've traveled parts of this continent that some people only dream about. And the more we talked about it, the more we kind of realized, you know, that there was a space for part-time RVers like us to go out and experience the best of North America on a really tight deadline. So that's why we're here. Let's get down to it. Dan, why don't you tell us how you've perfected our departure to make the most of the trips we take? So our departure time is we'll do as much preparation as we can, have everything hitched up. Bikes are loaded the night before, perhaps. And so whenever anybody finishes school and work, we can leave as soon as that's done. And sometimes that means leaving right before dinner. So rather than waiting for dinner and then leaving or leaving the next morning, whether it's Thursday, whether it's Friday, we get on the road at, you know, maybe 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon and we head down the road and make the most of our trip. One of the ways we do that is we'd love to tell you that we have all kinds of box lunches made and sandwiches are all prepped in the back seat. We're not that perfect or that organized. We're not that perfect. We're not that organized and we don't always uh, have all those big healthy snacks in the back seat. So one of the things that I learned and this came a, a tip from another friend is they will phone ahead and they will order pizza. And so one thing I've started to do sometimes is we'll get on the road. I know that we're going to pass through a small town. I know that it's got a pizza joint. I will phone ahead, order a large pepperoni pizza. And hey, it's not the healthiest meal, but it gets the job done. What I will tell you is that I took the girls on a solo trip, you know, kind of a daddy-daughter camping trip up to Tomogamy. And Tomogamy is about five or six hour drive from, you know, the Kitchener Guelph area this summer. And I didn't have Melina to do all the prep and the thinking ahead for us. And when we had everything packed, No, he said he didn't have Melina to do all the thinking for him. I didn't have her to do all the thinking. (laughs) You know, the girls and I just got excited and we hopped in the truck and we fired down the the road at 10 o'clock in the morning. And by the time we got to Gravenhurst, there was a growl in our tummies and it was COVID times and I hadn't thought ahead. And what I ended up doing was having to spend 10 or 15 minutes to get off the highway. Then I had to find a spot that was going to take the trailer and the truck, which meant I had to find a parking lot big enough. And of course it's COVID time. So then I had to line up outside of Subway to get three subs and three drinks and a bag of chips and get back in the truck. And it's another 10 minutes back onto the highway. And sure enough, we had killed an hour an hour and 15 minutes just getting three subs and so that's probably a good example of where I should have thought ahead and just called ahead and ordered a pizza or something to go along the way Mm -hmm. gets you out of your traditional Tim Hortons McDonald's burger type meals the one thing I say to make it work is try to pick a spot where you don't have to get off the highway or divert too far off your planned route of travel so I'm sure many of you have a greasy spoon you know of along the way or a chip wagon or somewhere along the way but that's the kind of spot where you want to phone your order in ahead of time and it'll be ready there throw it in the back seat and the kids can start handing out food 
And if you've listened to any of our previous episodes, you know we're super big fans of Google Satellite View. So, you know, use your use your Google Maps and just search for something along the route and then double check with the satellite filter on the map that you have enough room to pull in, pull out easily. And you can kind of do that as you're heading down the road. I guess the moral of the story is if you don't get off work till five o'clock on a Friday night, like don't assume that you can't leave till Saturday. Even if you're not a night person, you can still do it in such a way where, you know, things are are planned the day before and you just you know you come home from work you throw on some comfy clothes and you get in the truck and you drive and even if it gets you three or four hours down the highway from where we live that gets you to the border like you've already crossed the border if you're going south which is a huge way you can make gains on your vacation by just leaving you know don't don't count discount half days or just a couple of hours that you might get in that day and it might let you even just cross the border to non-peak time which could save you hours mm-hmm. as well and sometimes i think we just think about crossing the border is like that's a milestone in the trip just get across the border Mm -hmm. and then we can start to make up some miles or even if you're heading east right like i think we've kind of approached the the time in our history where there's no great time to travel through toronto like it's just there isn't (laughs) and so whether you do it you know five o'clock on a friday or like two o'clock on a saturday we've done both and it's you know if people are going to cottage country they're going to cottage country and you're going to be stuck in that traffic so you might as well get it done out of the way and you know find a place to stop for the night and pick up the next day and be able to make tracks instead of doing it the next morning and still having to sit in traffic that you wouldn't be able to avoid So let's talk about setting the drive time for day. So a lot of the times people and I was just having a conversation with somebody this week about they wanted to plan a trip and they're like, well, I want I want to travel 600 miles every day. Is that too much? And I think, you know, that's great. We tend to look at hours on the road versus miles down because there's so many things that play a factor. Uh, But I think, you know, some you certainly want to plan and and you have a rough guide of of how far you're going to go. But I say like, don't hem it in as in like, we have to hit 600 miles or you know, a 1000 kilometers every day, because that's a really long day. And you might not be able to, to do that consistently for four days in a row. So really playing it by ear, I think is super important. And you might just find you get yourself a second win. Many times we've just had a second win at four o'clock and decided to push through till 9 30 or 10 o'clock because everybody was cool with that Mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons we don't tend to pre-plan places to stay we have a rough idea but we don't generally plan where we want to stay until we're on the road and i know there's been a lot of talk about that lately with covid like a ton of people are camping a lot of your typical camping spots are booking up really quickly and people are afraid that if they don't book somewhere to stay that they're not going to have anywhere to stay but if you're going on a road trip type vacation where you're trying to head down long distances you're usually on highways you're usually on interstates you're usually on major roads where there's always some place to stay and if you can't find a private park to stay at and we use rv parky it's free Uh, We do a lot of that where we'll just think, okay, two hours, we're probably done in two hours. Let's go to RV Parky. We'll see what's around and call ahead. And if, and if somebody's full, you can guarantee you will find another park that's got availability. And if you can't, then you can always boondock somewhere. And there's always going to be somewhere when you're trying to make way or head across the country that you can boondock. And if you're unfamiliar with boondocking, have a listen to the episode uh, we put out on boondocking where we kind of give a little bit of the etiquette and some of the basics of boondocking, but don't be afraid not to plan where you're going to stay because I I guarantee you, you will always find a safe place to rest your head. Absolutely. I think the other thing we think about using it as well as hotels, Mm -hmm. hotels are great. You know, maybe you travel for business and you can collect a few points. So there's ways to do it economically. We're not talking about staying at the Four Seasons. We're talking about Holiday Inn Express and Courtyard Marriott's. And really those are oftentimes located near the highway. You've probably traveled yourself and noticed that, hey, there's the odd big truck parked out there or big vehicle well guess what you can park there too and the reason it works so well is that you put your miles down you are ready to pull off the road you get into the parking lot you park your rig you turn it off you have a go bag with you know your pajamas and some clean clothes for the next day and your toothbrush into the hotel grab some sleep get up breakfast is ready and waiting for you pour yourself a coffee back in the rig and off you go Mm -hmm. there's no disconnecting there's no making the beds there's no getting breakfast ready 
everything's good to go. You pick up where you left off. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, it's pretty well known by this point that both of us run the rig, like both of us tow, both of us will take turns driving, but it wasn't always that way. There was, there was a long period of time after we got our new trailer where I wasn't comfortable driving it. And it, and it took me a while to really work up the confidence to be able to drive at long distances or for Dan to be comfortable enough with me driving that he could like relax and have a nap, which he very much needed between stints, right? So for a lot of these trips we've taken, Dan's been the sole driver. Like when we went to Myrtle Beach and that was kind of a really unplanned trip, the trailer was fairly new at this point. I did not drive that whole trip. I think maybe I drove like an hour or two a day on very straight roads during the middle of the day just to kind of get my feel for it. But it it certainly is possible if you're thinking, well, that won't work for us because only one of us drives like if you have a com- uh, a partner that's comfortable driving you certainly can take some of these long trips still and get your feet wet and, and that's maybe just another side tip as well folks is if you want to learn how to drive the trailer and you're not comfortable with it doing it in downtown toronto or downtown atlanta or crossing the border is not the spot nice interstate the middle of the 401 in the middle of nowhere a little two-lane highway in ontario whichever province you live is the perfect spot to do it don't be intimidated by the speed because it's not the speed it's all the other actions that's going on around you Mm -hmm, for sure so kids obviously we have kids we started traveling with them very very young for long distances and uh, sometimes it's problematic (laughs) sometimes they get bored sometimes they just don't want to be in the car anymore and we all have our limit I mean I have my limit where I just go squirrely and I need out of the vehicle but I think we've we've done enough long trips that we we've devised some plans to kind of keep everybody traveling well and comfortable and entertained. And I think the biggest lesson we learned very, very quickly. And I mean, I don't know, it shouldn't, I think it's just a a product of maybe this generation is like kids always have water bottles with them. And when we took road trips as kids, it was like, nope, you were just like, I never remember having a drink. Like you were just parched till we got there, right? Like sit in the backseat and we'll don't ask when we're going to get there type of thing. But our kids like drink a ton of water. And so we were like, yeah, sure, bring your water bottle. And they have like these one and a half liter bottles in the back seat. So we had to have a lot of stops and uh, that definitely wasn't ideal. So we learned kind of the hard way about that. Absolutely. A nine-year-old kid does not need to drink 500 milliliters (laughs) of water every hour because whatever goes in has got to come out. And, you know, that means pulling over and getting off the highway to, to give them a little bit of a rest stop. Even if you have a trailer, it still takes time. So manage your fluid consumption. Mm -hmm. And another thing I would say is in terms of food and snacks, the more food and snacks you bring in the cab, the faster it will get eaten. Like you could have an entire turkey dinner with all the trimmings in your cab and it will be eaten within the first hour you're on the road and then people will complain that they're hungry and they need to eat and they need to stop or else they're just gonna pass out, they're so hungry. And I think this was on our Route 66 trip when we went to California. What we did is we actually brought a bunch of like empty Chinese food containers and I made a box lunch for everybody. And there was cool stuff in it. Like we we would make like a wrap one day or a sandwich or pasta salad and then we would put like, you know, crackers and hummus and cut up vegetables. And then I, everyone would have their own little container of candy, like Skittles, Mike and Ike's, that type of thing. But we get, we handed everybody a box and we're like, look, this is your box. This is your box lunch. Like once this is done, this is your snacks and your lunch until we stop for dinner. So once this is done, that's it. There's no more food. We're not stopping. And once we kind of laid out those expectations and they kind of could see this quantifiable amount of food in their lap in this box, they were very careful about how they ate it. And it was certainly enough food to get you through the day. I don't know if my kids are good with money, but they can certainly make a food budget in the back of the truck. (laughs) And, And actually, you know, it gets you out of all those questions about when's lunch. Lunch is in the cooler right beside you and you decide if you want to eat your food right now but it and that kind of passed the time a little quickly as well because they weren't having to think about being hungry they just had a little nibble and you put miles down the road Mm -hmm. I would say if there was one decision we've we've started to implement for long road trips like that is probably the one that saved us the most the most time to get us further down the road um what else cooler we keep a cooler in the back seat that's got the box lunches we the kids are in charge of it like if somebody in the driver's seat wants something from their box lunch the kids in the back they know their job is to drop what they're doing and unzip the cooler and hand it up to us say pringles but maybe that's a story for another day in another podcast i think that's a story for another day we will talk about what happens when you hit your wall because we have some interesting stories about that i think my nickname is pringles but we'll talk about that on another (laughs) podcast oh neck pillows 
the amount of whining that was in our vehicle, and this is probably like something that people who travel a lot have anyway, but we did not have neck pillows for the longest time. And oh my gosh, the uncomfortable whining from the back seat when people got tired was like ridiculous. So, and then nobody wanted anybody else to lean on their shoulder to sleep. And so we purchased some neck pillows and we, we got ones with little clips on them. So they hang on the back of the seat. That has been a fantastic addition when somebody just wants to chill out and have a nap. But to go a little bit further, I think you need to make the most of opportunities to stretch your legs. And these could be quick five minute trips. When we were on our cross continental road trip in 2018, anytime we passed a state line, there's usually a visitor information center or like a rest stop. And we would pull into those every time we crossed a state line. And the US just does these absolutely amazingly. They're just so well kept. Many of them are so clean. They're just amazing spots to pull over and a little milestone in your trip to make a little video or a picture log of capturing a picture of going into Kentucky or Kansas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether somebody needs to use the washroom or not, the rule is everybody has to get out and stretch their legs. So they've got a little R&R. And some of these places are full on information booths and like visitor information centers. So there is like brochures galore. So we very early on told the kids, be good consumers. But if there's something you think we're really going to want to see or want to go back and see, yeah, take the brochures and then they would sit there quietly for like two hours afterwards and thumb through all of the brochures they got for haunted walks that they could go on in certain cities and farms and even we found new destinations doing it that way and even you know your spouse will stay a little bit quiet in the other seat while you're going down the road excuse (laughs) me Um, but I think, you know, they're also like leg stretching opportunities, like groceries. If you need to stop and get groceries, that's just a great opportunity. Just give people enough time so that they can spend five or 10 minutes outside the car every now and then, and just really like have a good stretch and like run around a parking lot if they need to burn some energy off or something. But I think, you know, we've had some really good memories at places where we've just stopped to stretch our legs. Yeah. Like to tell them about the long haired or the Longhorn cattle in New Mexico at a rest stop. Well, mm. New Mexico, yeah, it was it was super hot that day. And it was like the middle of the day, maybe like three o'clock or something. So we, we stopped at this uh, rest stop on the side of the highway. And it was right beside a, a field just full of these amazing, beautiful Longhorn cattle. The girls like have a big stretch and run over the fence to see these cows. And I don't know, there was like 50 of them. Like there was a lot, hey? And... I turned around. I'm like, oh, cool. So I turn around and get my nice, like, fancy camera with the big telephoto lens because I'm going to take some amazing pictures of these longhorn cattle. As I'm turning around to get my camera out of the cab of the truck, the ground rumbles. And then I turn around and oh, all of the cows are gone. And I was like, did I just, like, imagine the cows? I'm like, where did the cows go? Well, our oldest daughter had pulled a crocodile Dundee and stared the cattle down and they took off on her so literally i'm like what happened to the cows and i was like she scared them and i'm like well what did you do and she's like nothing i just looked at them and she did the thing where you know where like you point your like the i'm watching you like you point your fingers to your eyes and like to the other person and they all just took off so i missed my uh I missed my opportunity for the beautiful longhorn cattle pictures, but um, we found out cows are afraid of my daughter for some weird reason. And we found an awesome Route 66 museum just outside of Oklahoma. In In, Oklahoma, outside of Oklahoma City. I think it was Elk City. And, and, you know, it was closed for the day, but it had an open parking lot. You were more than free to walk around. Think of it like a park type setting. It was a recreation type village. That was an awesome experience. We went to literally a no-name restaurant in Colorado. Rest Pardon stop. me. No-name <laughs> rest stop in Colorado, right at the bottom of a beautiful mountain. It was full of people crossing the country in rental RVs and Europeans, and we just had a picnic on the grass and stretched our legs, played a bit of Frisbee. You know, just like a lot of these, like, family little things and their memories and stuff that you, that you have and keep happen on a lot of these places where you just decide to stretch your legs. Antique shops are another huge one for us. I love antiquing. So, guaranteed anytime you find an antique spot you're going to find a great big parking lot because they're usually located in barns or warehouses not always (laughs) but Mm -hmm. uh, we're probably what like 50 close to 50 feet with the truck and the trailer and I had I didn't use my google satellite view imagine that and I wanted to go to this place in Asheboro North Carolina as there was something specific I was looking for. We went and it was called an antique warehouse, which is usually a big building in the middle of nowhere. No, this place was like in a in a, an old Woolworths downtown department store. Tiny downtown streets, tight corners, cars parked everywhere.
everywhere. Dan was pissed. But there was... (laughs) There's no challenge I'm not up to. (laughs) He did the most amazing maneuvering. We eventually found a bank to park at. So he did an amazing job. But um, places like that are always always fantastic. They have clean washrooms that you can browse around. The kids see neat stuff and you uh, get back on your way. And these trips or the side trips don't have to take any more than five or 10 minutes, really. I think the lesson out of this is whether it's an antique store or it's QP Burger, it's about getting off the beaten path because that's why you have an RV. McDonald's in North Carolina is the same at McDonald's in Canada. So it's all these little oddball spots where you get off the beaten path and those are what you remember and those are what make the day go by so much quicker. Mm -hmm. In terms of keeping them entertained, we make sure that we pre-download a lot of shows on their devices. When the kids were littler and they actually didn't have devices, like we would give them our phones so that they could take pictures and oh my gosh that was life-changing the 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 coolest pictures from some of our trips came from our kids sitting in the back seat uh taking pictures of stuff through the window and it was so neat to see these road trips through their eyes and then they would sit there for hours and just like edit them put filters on them and just really kind of bring their creative nature out and this was a big lesson for me because I was here I was taking them across North America and there's so much to see and I was sitting in in the driver's seat and I would look in the rearview mirror and I just see them pounding away on their devices and I'm like I did not bring you to pound away on your device I was taking a deep breath and realizing that pick my battles and then I didn't say anything and we stopped at the next rest stop and and Fiona pulled out this amazing picture and she had been in the backseat editing the photo. And so it was a good lesson for me that what I thought was happening was not happening. And so she was digesting the whole trip, but the kids digest the trip differently than you do. And and so if they play with a picture in the backseat and they analyze it, they're thinking about what you showed them. And sometimes it takes a couple of days for things to settle in. And even two years later, they'll be sitting at the dinner table and they'll say, remember that time. And it sinks in for them because they're kids. Mm -hmm, For sure. Another huge thing I know we've talked about this before so I'll make it brief but podcasts are like massive for us when we travel hopefully you're listening to the RV Canucks when you travel but we have a really good one for kids or my favorite good one for kids is called Brains On our kids are you know 12 and 15 right now but sometimes we still listen to it because it's got some really cool answers to like science questions that the kids still ask that we don't know the answer to so it's a fantastic I would say probably about I don't know, ages six and up, it would be, it would be great for, and they're, they're quick. They're, you know, 30 minutes. And we really kind of, this is what got us onto podcasting. We really just stumbled across it. We didn't know that when we started the route 66 trip, we were going down the highway. It was the second day. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. Our nine-year-old, you know, was sitting in her seat. She had her seatbelt on, but before you knew it, she was in the back seat like a caged animal because she needed to get some energy out. And I slapped on a podcast and really as a family of four, we'd never listened to podcasts before that. And it was completely new to that. And she calmed right back down and I didn't think anything more of it until the next day at two o'clock like clockwork. She seemed like a caged animal and I popped on another podcast and it, it could have been about running. It could have been about history. Who it knows? Was stuff you missed in history class. Another great podcast. And, and she calmed right down. And that's when I learned the podcast. The rest of the trip was something that we usually put on after about an hour and a half, two hours on the road. And we were able to anticipate those times when kids just need to let something go. And and it calmed them right down. They get right into it. You really learn the most amazing and useless pieces of information. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, other typical games, road trip bingo, looking for license plates. If we're in Canada, we look for foreign license plates or license plates from other provinces. If we're in the States, we look for Canadian license plates and try to see if there's anybody from home. Um, You know, if we're on big trips and they see other trailers or other buses going down the road, uh, they will they will do like arm pump thing for the truckers. <laughs> oh, we met just, well, we didn't really meet him. I don't know what his name is, but the kids started doing that on our way home through Charlotte uh, to an older gentleman in a big class A rig. And before you know it, an hour down the road, we're both in at the same rest stop and the kids are chatting with him and waving. It just passed the time so quickly. So thank you to some random guy in Charlotte. <laughs> I think the girls did the same thing as we were going back down the other way. We were going through Atlanta. We hit a traffic jam and, you know, I would declare Atlanta to have the most friendly traffic jams in the world. They put down their window. They started talking to a guy in a white Kia from Florida who was on his way back from a NASCAR race. And they probably had a good five or 10 minute conversation with this gentleman, mm-hmm. you know, played a little bit of rock, paper, scissors, but it certainly passed the time and off we went. They love playing rock, paper, scissors with random people even still. But it, it usually, I would say like 99% of the time people play back with them. Big but. shout out to Atlanta and Charlotte. <laughs> yeah. So 
how far can you actually travel on a one or two week vacation? We've actually, through our experience, we sat at the table, we did a few calculations. And, you know, when we did Ontario to LA down Route 66, we basically, we got there in five days, but travel time, you could do it in four. We took an extra day to go see the Grand Canyon, which was absolutely beyond amazing because we had never been there before. But really, I mean, if you left on a Friday, you could get there by Tuesday or Wednesday if you stopped at the Grand Canyon. You could spend a day or two in Southern California and go back home. And you can do that in a one week vacation if your ultimate goal is just the road trip experience. And we probably could have cut that down because keep in mind, we saw and stopped in Kansas for the inspiration to Mater. We stopped at the Midpoint Cafe. We stopped at Cadillac the Ranch. Cadillac Ranch. We stopped to scare some cows in New Mexico. We saw a lot of stuff along the way. And if you would have cut some of that stuff out, we would have been there even quicker. And those are all great things we're going to talk about later. Mm -hmm. I, th I just think it's really a comforting thought to think like we can dip our toes in the Pacific Ocean in like as little as three days. Like it, it's just, it's mind blowing how far you can go. For those of us who are used to type of camping where we show up somewhere on Friday and, and leave Sunday to go home, you can, you can do that with a week almost anywhere. And you can have that kind of the weekend camping wherever your destination is and then turn around, come back home and you see the, the most awesome stuff. Some people think that's, you know, a waste of time, but we look as part of the journey is not just the destination, it's the getting there, right? And I think, you know, if you had two weeks using the same example, you know, going all the way to LA, you could spend a week in Southern California and there's so much to see in Southern and Central California and then loop back around and come home. And that's exactly what we did. We did take a little bit longer for this trip. It was, a, it was planned out well in advance. We got permission to work from the road virtually. And in a post COVID world, a lot of people are doing that. The kids were off school for the summer vacation. We worked a couple of days here and there, but even with two weeks, I mean, you could go all the way down routes. 66, see everything there is to see, spend a week or almost a week in California, turn around. We came home through Las Vegas. We came home through Utah, Colorado, Colorado Kansas, we, Missouri. We, we took a detour, a big detour in Missouri to see Walt Disney's hometown. We're huge Disney nerds. So that was like the coolest museum. Um, and then we stopped in Springfield, Illinois on the way home. And so you can, you can do so much with your vacations from work. And I wish more people realized that or maybe had the confidence to just go out there and do it because these are life-changing trips. And if you're short on vacation, leverage the long weekend, leverage uh, a day when Monday is a holiday. So take off Friday, Monday's a holiday, and then you only need to use four days vacation the next week to extend that trip even further if you don't have that opportunity. But you know, that trip, we saw everything, but we left so much behind that we want to go back and see even more stuff. And I think that's the sign of a good trip. Mm -hmm. And even last summer, you know, Isla, we asked her what she wanted for her birthday and she said she wanted a road trip. So we're like, okay, cool. So we went down to Orlando, you know, we left on a Monday, we got there by Wednesday, which was her birthday. We stayed at the, at Disney's Fort Wilderness Campground, which was just amazing. We'll detail that in another trip. But you know, we turned around after a few days in Orlando, and we made a detour on the way home to see St. Augustine, Florida, which is something that's been on my bucket list for a very, very long time. Was it the shortest way home? No, but it fit within we had to come home, I had a wedding to attend. So we had to be home by like that Saturday afternoon of the next week. And we took we were in St. Augustine, one afternoon and one night. Like we got there about one or two o'clock. We checked into the Anastasia State Park. We set up, we unhooked, we went into St. Augustine, the old town. We saw two museums, walked the cobblestone streets. We went out for dinner, went back to the campsite, hung out. We saw the sunrise on the beach the next morning and we hitched up and we left. And that was probably one of the shortest places we've ever stopped, but it was one of the ones that has the most lasting memories. Like we had a really relaxed pace. We weren't rushed. We saw a lot. It was a super cool place that we all want to go back to, but it felt like almost like a mini vacation in that trip in and of itself. Maybe I can talk about spare gas for a second because oh, I don't yeah. think we talked about that. No, we so didn't. On our first trip down to Myrtle Beach, when we gave the kids too much water, um, what we also realized is that getting traveling in the U.S. is not like traveling on a freeway in Canada. And so in, in Canada, there's many more opportunities to pull off to a service center, gas up, and move along. And for our American listeners, a service center is privately run. It's got gas. It's not nearly as relaxing or as elaborate as what you might have at the side of the road, but it has gas. So as a traveler, you can pull off, get gas, and be back on the highway pretty quickly. In the U.S., which we learned is that to get gas, 
We would drive down the interstate. We would see the truck stop. So there's 10 minutes to get off the highway. There's 10 or 15 minutes to get gas and use the washroom. There's another 10 or 15 minutes back on the highway. So inevitably you're losing 30 to 45 minutes every time you need gas. So the next time we made a trip, I began to travel with spare gas. And so what that meant is inevitably there's going to be an unplanned P stop, a short diversion. Maybe you're stuck in traffic. Maybe something happens. And what that lets me do is it lets me add a little bit of a splash of tank to the truck and I can maybe skip one gas stop that day, which saves me 45 minutes. Maybe it just lets us push through some bad traffic at the end of the day and we can gas up first thing in the morning when everybody's fresh, but it saved our bacon just a number of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great, great point. Um, We actually crunched some numbers in terms of some of these trips you can do from where we're located, which is southern Ontario. You know, if you think about it from where we are, you could get to Halifax in 18 hours. Myrtle Beach um, or anywhere in the Carolinas from here is 16 hours up to Pancake Bay, which we talked about in episode one, is, you know, 10 hours away, which is still a good hike. Um, Letchworth State Park in New York State, which we love, is only three hours away. You know, when you think about ways you can broaden your experience beyond just the handful of campgrounds that are, you know, just within half an hour of you, um, Washington, D.C. is nine hours away, and they have a fantastic RV park Uh, called Cherry Hill RV Park and they actually have a bus that goes it stops right at the RV park that will take you into downtown Washington to see all of the sites now I know I mean when you're listening to this a lot of the borders and stuff are still closed but they will open again um you know there's a lot of places that we can you can even see just within Canada heading out to the east you know going west for us is a little more problematic because we spend you you're basically like what 15 hours to get out of Ontario but hey you know want to go hang out in Manitoba sure you could do that if you have a week absolutely and you know what I think the big lesson we learned is we've got lots of little tips here. There's got to be a couple dozen ideas we've given you. If you even use only two or three of these, you will build up an endurance. I'm not suggesting that you know, your first big road trip ought to be out to California. Maybe it's just down to Myrtle Beach. Maybe it's down to Florida. But what you will find is that you will build up some endurance in your family and time will just fly by. Mm -hmm. And things don't always go as planned. We are not always happy-go-lucky. There is a lot of F-bombs in our truck when (laughs) things go wrong. I'm not going to lie. And, you know, we hit walls, man. Hit up our Instagram in the next day or two because when Dan hits a wall, he hits a wall. And when he hits a wall, he like cannot stop laughing even though he's like tired and angry and stuff. And I'm just telling you folks, listening to this, like you will want to save it to your own camera just to play for when you have bad days because, (laughs) and just, you know, we all have them. We've all been there, but I I would not trade all any of the stress we've ever experienced on the road for the memories that we're making because literally these are memories that will live with your family for the rest of your lives and hopefully God willing are the same memories that you'll be able to share with your grandkids. And so I think there's just there's there's no better balm when life gets stressed than to hit the road and take a road trip. I really think it's one of life's greatest pleasures. I really think people who just hop on a plane to travel places, really miss out on that. Absolutely. So that's that. That's what we have to say. Yeah. So um, once again, if you have not followed us on Facebook and Instagram at RV Connects, you will definitely want to do that. And uh, check out the show notes for this podcast on our website at rvconnects.com, where I'm going to list all of the tips we've kind of rambled out today. I'll make them a little more coherent for you. I'll mention some of the places that we like to stay on the road. And I think at some point in the next couple of weeks, we're actually going to start diving into our Route 66 road trip. So we're going to do a couple of episodes on that. We're going to break it down by legs and really dig into the nitty gritty of that trip. Some of the cool things to see. You can come along with us on that ride come along for the journey learn Mm -hmm. a few more things places you might want to go to you don't even have to do the whole trip maybe Mm -hmm. just hit one of those places along the way but you know we have so much fun doing this and you listening to us and don't be afraid to shoot some questions back to us because we have a ton of fun doing this absolutely we're just here to have a little bit of fun folks totally all right that's it for us we will talk to you next week bye-bye bye